Hey guys, this is the third segment of the Precambrian chapter uh, and we have gone through most everything except the life and its origin. And I know this is a hard topic to cover because people have different opinions about it. Um, there are a couple of things I, I want to make sure that you understand that all discussion about the origin of life have to be speculation since nobody really knows what has happened and nobody have been able to reconstruct it yet. Uh, of course we have a bunch of theories and in this class we will actually talk about the scientific views. Um, there is another misconception a lot of the times that, that a lot of people think that um, evolution is absolutely not true because we don't even know how life started. I want to make sure that you understand that evolution and the origin of life is an absolute different topic. Evolution happens from the, from the first organism, which was for sure a, 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 a living thing, and, and from that moment evolution has started. But evolution does not talk about the origin of life, so it's two different things and don't mix the two together. We do know for a fact that life has started very, very early, almost as soon as the first crust developed uh, and the earth surface cooled down enough that actually the water uh, vapor condensed and the ocean started to form. Uh, to originate life by natural processes, uh, which means from non-living matter, uh, to make living uh, things. This is what we call abiogenesis. Uh, life must have passed through a prebiotic stage in which the matter have showed signs of living things but was not truly living. Probably you all know that uh, we have the viruses and the viruses are not really living. They need to have hosts to show living kind of conditions but you understand that they're not li really living. So the prebiotic stage might have been something similar to the viruses. Uh, the origin of life has two requirements. Uh, one is the source for the appropriate elements, which are in you, in, in the organic matter, and which we had during the early earth. I mean, we did have the carbon, the oxygen, and the hydrogen. It was all present. And the other thing is the energy sources which would promote the chemical reactions which needed to be done to support life and it's still happening. Uh, we have two kinds of energy sources life can use right now and one is the oxygen based that is when the energy source is the sun, the sun and you know that the plants are doing the photosynthesis they get the, the energy from the sun and that's how they make uh, food from the water and the, and the sunshine food, um, the, the CO2, the sunshine and the water will make the sugar and then other things eat the plants. So the energy source for that kind of life is the sun. But probably you all know that there is another environment where life can exist and happily around the mid-oceanic ridges where the temperature is extremely high and um, there is no oxygen present. and um, around the black smokers, around the mid-oceanic ridge, and there is very, very happy life around that area too. So, okay, let's go on. If we think about the condition of the very early Earth, it was producing atmosphere, we didn't really have oxygen. Um, there was free hydrogen, and we did have CH4, NH3, and H2. So every every element for organic molecules were right there, and um, and the energy could have come from electric discharge or solar energy. There was no uh, ozone layer at the time, so the solar energy all came down to the to the earth. And uh, we know that the earth temperature probably was much higher than it is today, and we assume that there had to be a whole lot of storms during this time. Um, there has been some scientists who putting together, uh, did put together the early conditions on a 
of, of the earth in the lab right here. That's the apparat. Uh, his name, the guy's name was Miller and Uri. They, uh, they, they are Americans. And they put water with all the, uh, no, they put water in one, uh, in the container and they put all the gases which were present in the early atmosphere and they used the electric charges to present the energy and actually they could produce some um, amino acids uh, about 15 of them um, there were other biologically important molecules uh, during their, their um, lab examinations too so it's kind of important this was the first, it was in the 1950s. Um, later, uh, other scientists did very similar experiments and uh, they could uh, produce nucleotides. Now, these experiments cannot reprodu reproduce the ex exact conditions of the primitive Earth, of course, so we shall never know what exactly happened. But it can be shown that the basic building blocks, blocks for the large macromolecules can be synthesized in vitro from inorganic compounds. So that is an important thing that it could be done. Uh, so it's kind of interesting. And um, now we're going to talk about the fossil record of, of the earliest life. First, we didn't really have fossils. The very first thing was the so-called indirect evidence uh, for the life. And we, we do have the belief that life may have already evolved by the time the oldest land rocks were deposited. And one of the reasons for that is because some of the oldest rocks uh, were containing graphite uh, with an isotopic ratio of carbon 12 and 13 that is identical to that produced by living systems. Remember, carbon has um, three isotopes. We learned it in the geologic time chapter, the 12, 13, and the 14. And actually, at the time, I, I already told you that this is very important. When you don't have fossils present, you can still tell if there was living material there because of the carbon 12, 13 ratio. So in the earliest rocks, the carbon-12 ratio was very much sim similar to what is produced by living systems. So we believe that there must have been life present that just didn't leave uh, impressions or fossils after themselves. We believe that these living things probably were teeny tiny bacteria and they must have been anaerobic, anaerobic because there was no oxygen present, we know. And their food must have been uh, dissolved material from the seawater, so so they were heterotrophic, which means they didn't make their own food. And the next thing we have to talk about is the origin of archaeobacteria. That happened about 3.5 billion years ago. Uh, recently, biologists have discovered a variety of extremely simple bacteria. And these guys um, appear to be the most primitive life forms on Earth, and probably they are the closest to the ancestor of all life. Um, almost all of these primitive bacteria are hypothermophile, which means that they can thrive in extremely high temperatures, uh, basically up to the boiling point of the Earth. If you, if you think the first time that when the water started to condense, it was really close to boiling. Uh, so these bacteria live usually today in hot springs around volcanic regions, like just like at the time when the Earth actually uh, formed. Uh, so they really perfectly good explanations for the origin of life. Um, and they actually feed on the elemental sulfur, which comes out from the volcanoes. The characteristics of these bacteria strongly argue that life rose deep in the ocean uh, of the Archean, where we had extremely um, active volcanic life underwater 
and uh, we must have had a lot of volcanic vents that, like we have today around the mid oceanic ridges and these vents would have provided chemical and heat energy uh, abundant mineral composition compounds including sulfur and um, it gave these living things a lot of protection against the UV lights because they were in deep water so therefore they could survive now we talk we're going to talk about the fossil bacteria and these guys are prokaryotic uh, they are archaebacteria or eubacteria and these are the most dominant uh, the eubacteria formed the so-called stromatolites and these were very very important because these guys were photosynthetic which means you know photosynthesis when you have CO2 plus water and using the sun energy to make sugar and oxygen so this the byproduct of photosynthesis is the oxygen the free oxygen these guys actually made the free oxygen in our atmosphere so they are very very important they are very common in the upper Archean as shallow water shelves begin to form at this time and um, in the Precambrian church actually you can find molds of of um, of these individual bacteria for some reason these two slides here didn't come up the pictures but on your slideshow for sure it will be so don't worry about it the first fossil considered to be organic origin is about 3.5 billion years old and it was found in uh, in a church in Australia the so-called Pilbara shield these fossils are already these um, stromatolites the, the the stromatolites I don't want you to be uh, confused this this earliest fossils they are uh, actually um, cyanobacteria but at the beginning scientists thought that they were blue green algae so they misnamed them that we still call them blue green algae but now we know that they have nothing to do with algae they are basically cyanobacteria and we also call them stromatolites so there is these three names going around and make sure that whichever names you hear you understand that we're talking about these so the stromatolite blue green algae which is misnamed because it's not algae they are really actually cyanobacteria what is important about them that they can live in extreme conditions they photosynthesize so they made the oxygen the free oxygen for our atmosphere and they actually take over they are all over the earth everywhere and this one here is the the stromatolite at the Pilbara Shield in Australia and this is where you can find them and this is how they look like and I myself work with stromatolites in the Triassic so I really have seen a whole lot of them these guys look just like the ones living today I went to the Bahamas I saw them they look just like this and I saw Cambrian stromatolites they have not changed they are uh, reproducing asexually they they have not changed throughout geologic time and they are still around um, they are actually like corals today they they aggression they they grow by um, secreting a uh, little um, sediment particles and uh, they become completely laminated and they are building uh, they have building communities and they 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 are prokaryotic and I'm gonna tell you I think it's on the next slide yes uh, they are prokaryotic and prokaryotic just means that they they do not have nucleus in their cell and so therefore uh, they have mitochondria chloroplast and similar organelles and they reproduce asexually so they are boring they will not be able to evolve very easily because the asexual uh, division will not promote evolution because we don't have much variation in this case as I told you they still live today one of the environment they live in is in the Bahamas 
And if you dive in the Bahamas, you can see these amazing stromatolite columns. And this is how they look like in the Bahamas. Actually, I was walking on stromatolite flats because this is in the subtidal zone, but it's always underwater. But when it's on the surface, then they will make these algae mats. So this is how the subtidal... Actually, it's really interesting because if, if you live in Roanoke, Virginia, we do have two quarries right here in Roanoke. One is the Rockydale, which is on 220, and the other one is the Boxic Quarry, which will include stromatolites. Also, the the, uh, the Hockey Stone, Virginia Tech Hockey Stone, is from a quarry in Blacksburg, which also have a lot of stromatolites. So stromatolites are all over the Earth history, so it's kind of interesting. The other present-day location for, for living stromatolites is in Australia, around Perth, the Shark Bay, and this is how they look like. And the last thing we have to talk about is the mineral resources of the Archean. Probably the most important mineral uh, resource from the Archean is the gold. You will find this gold in Johannesburg, South Africa, and in, in South Africa, like this rock is from there, is forming in conglomerates. And then you can find it in uh, Canada and South Dakota. Uh, the other very important thing is the massive sulfide, uh, such as zinc, copper, and nickel. Sulfide, remember when we think about zinc sulfide, it's the ZNS, the sphalerite. If you remember from physical judge, you might not. And then the copper sulfate is the cacopyrite, that's CUFES2. And then the nickel sulfide. Uh, so these are very, very important. And we also have the so-called hydrothermal deposits. And these guys are related to volcanism in the greenstone belts. Hydrothermal deposits uh, have a lot of metallic sources. It has gold possibly galena, fluoride, uh, and they belong to the volcanoes when, when the magma starts to cool down and it reaches about 370 degrees Celsius, that's when the hydrothermal phase starts. So these minerals form about 374 down to, to 25 degrees Celsius. And we have a lot of these deposits in Western Australia, Zimbabwe, Africa, and Ontario, Canada. So these are the important things. I will ask you to please tell me a couple of mineral resources of the Archaea and the location. So that's, you will have to know the goal, the massive sulfides, hydrothermal deposits, and a couple of the locations, and you're good to go. So this is the end of the, the third segment of the Precambrian, and I will see you in the Proterozoic. Bye for now.